Hey everybody, welcome to the Retro Hack Shack. I'm Aaron Newcomb. And this is a special episode today, at least for me. As you might be able to tell from my t-shirt, we're going to be talking about the TRS-80 color computer. If you're familiar with these machines, you'll recognize the green screen. And behind me is a Color Computer One. And that was my very own first computer that I ever used. And it's also where I learned basics and learned a, a love of programming and fixing things up. So really excited about this particular episode. And I'm excited about this month because this is Septandy, the month of September. Uh, a lot of us have decided to do episodes around Tandy related content. So I'm gonna be talking about this Coco One, but you can find more links to more people that are doing more discussions of Tandy related items down below. So people like Jan Beta, Adrian Black, LGR, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's quite a number of people that have decided to do this. I may do two or three episodes related to Tandy related things. I don't know. But uh, anyway, we're going to take a look at this Coco One and see what it needs in terms of repair and refurbishment. It's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. All right, so I'm out here at the ping pong table. This is kind of where I work on my larger projects. Uh, keeps them off the kitchen table. That's a good thing. Um, but anyway, the, just looking at this Coco One, there's several things I want to test before I take it over to the bench and start working on it. One thing off the bat, there's several, I don't know, uh, s sticky stuff on here, residue. The case just needs a general cleaning. So that's one thing I'm going to do. The second thing I want to do is I just want to test the video and see how the video output is and see if I want to do any sort of modification to the video output. So to test that, I've hooked up a splitter and connected it both to an LCD display, which is nice just to get out quickly and, and run some ga play some games or something like that. It's a lot lighter than what I have over here, which is the CRT. So I'm going to, I have got the splitter connected to both the LCD and the CRT, and I'm going to test both just to see what the quality difference is on each. So let's go ahead and turn these on. There we go. And turn on the Coco One. So I don't know if you noticed that the CRT obviously comes on immediately as soon as I turn on the Coco One. The LCD, it's almost like the tuner is trying to find the right frequency or something when I turn this on. Also, if you, I don't know if you can see this, it's probably very hard to get on the camera. So I might put in some stills, maybe you can see it better. There is a difference in quality that I can see at least to my eye looking at this, uh, not on the video, but as I sit in front of it. So the, the text here is much easier to read and it's much clearer. If I look at this M, for example, in Microsoft or M in From, it looks dark and complete. And of course I can see the scan lines as well, but other than the scan lines, the M looks solid. If I look over here on the LCD, the M looks blurry and not as solid. So to my eye anyway, the CRT is definitely looking better. And I am wondering if I hook up a composite mod, if that will improve the display on the LCD. It would be nice to have the option. Also, because I don't always want to lug around a CRT if I'm taking this to a convention or a, um, some sort of an event. So I might just add the composite mod. Um, and I also need to test out the keyboard to see if that works. Obviously, the system's working. I've tested that before just to make sure it was working. I have tested a cartridge as well, so I know that works. But the keyboard is another issue. So, oh yeah. Yeah, so this is, you know, remember, this is a 40-year-old system here. Chiclet keyboard. I don't know if it's... Uh, foam and foil, the old Mylar type of um, keyboard, or if it's rubber dome. I mean, it's not the worst chiclet keyboard in the world, but it's definitely not. Some keys are just not working. So there's three things I think that I want to do. Definitely we'll want to clean this up at the end. Oh. And not only that, but we're missing a foot, <laughs> I just discovered as well. So I have to add a foot onto that. We'll need to give it a good clean. Uh, try to add the composite mod and then definitely fix this keyboard and I'll see how far we get. Okay, so before I take this apart, a couple of interesting facts about the Coco One. Uh, first off, it was released in 1980. So this machine is 40 years old. 
or at least this first model of the color computer is 40 years old. And it was released uh, at the same time as the TRS-80 Model 3 and also the TRS-80 Pocket Computer. They all came out on the same day. And, you know, it was like $700, I think, for the Model 3. This was $400, and the, I think the Pocket Computer was uh, two or $300, I don't remember. So they all came out at the same time, and they're 40 years old, so that's kind of cool. Uh, the other interesting fact is there was three of these models that came out, um, uh, the, the Coco 1. There was three models, sub-models, I don't know, uh, model numbers you could get. One had 4K of RAM, one had 16K of RAM, and one had 32K of RAM. And if you're wondering what the model number is, there we go. So I can, uh, you can see the model here maybe if you look closely, it's 26-3003. And the 4K model was 3001, the 16K model was 3002, and the 32K model is 3003, which is what this is. So I'm not sure, I've had some discussions online about the serial number 7073. Seems like a low serial number, but uh, it depends, you know, of course, whether this, you know, serial number is tied to this specific model number. I assume it is. Uh, I've also heard online that the um, they didn't always follow a, um, you know, they start at zero and go up to however many they, they produce. They didn't always follow that, especially at Radio Shack at the time. So I don't know if this really is a low serial number or not. We're actually trying to do some research to find out, try to gather some serial numbers and see. Um, if we can kind of piece together how many of these are out in the wild, because there isn't really good information about them. So let's take this apart, and then I'll tell you one more interesting thing about, uh, about the Model 1. And there's a screw in the middle. It says right here, opening the case will void the warranty. So I don't think the warranty is probably good after 40 years, but uh, it's kind of interesting to see that that hadn't been broken before. So I may be the first one to actually open this up. Perhaps nobody's worked on it. Pretty cool. All right, let's take a look at what's inside. There we go. We should just be able to, there we go. Pull the case off. All right, Oh, well, this is interesting. There's a 3003D, which must be maybe this revision of the motherboard. I'll have to see if that's written down somewhere else. Uh, someone's written with, with Sharpie or something. And look at the, uh, the inside of the case as well. Really interesting. So you get, it looks like SN428. So maybe, maybe this was made April 28th or someone quality control checked it or something. April 28th, 1980 or 1981. So very cool. It's always kind of fun to see those uh, little touches that people put in these older systems. All right, so here's, this looks pretty good. We've got a couple of big caps here. Um, I'm not too worried about these the caps on this board because the video looked good enough to me that I don't think there's any issue with the caps. Certainly not having any problems. Um, these aren't the type that typically leak all over the board or anything like that. And plus they're from the early 80s. The caps from the early 80s seem to be more reliable than the later caps like you, you get in uh, when you start getting into the mid 80s, late 80s with some, some of the, uh, the Macintoshes and Amigas and some of those types of systems. They, they kind of really had a bad batch of caps. These caps are pretty good. Everything works okay, so I'm probably not going to change them out. But at the same time, you could just to future proof it. So maybe I'll do that at some point. Okay, so first things first, I want to be able to take the keyboard out of here. Let's see if we can do that. There we go. Bingo. So unlike the, the older uh, systems, the later systems, they had kind of a flat flex type of a cable that plugged into a socket on the board. And those are notoriously, you know, they dry out and crack and then they need to be replaced. This one actually has right angle pins down here for the... Uh, for the keyboard, so that's pretty cool. We'll come back to the keyboard later, and we need to get this plate off of here so we can see what's inside. There we go. So let's pause for a moment and just take a look at the various ICs and IO ports that are available on the system. The first thing that's worth pointing out is that the color computer was based on a reference design from Motorola, 
and it's not the only one. The most notable other system probably uh, is the Dragon 32, which was available in Europe. So that's why the two systems are uh, semi-compatible with each other. You can run some programs on uh, both machines from one to the other, not 100% though. So the first thing when looking at this board to point out is the CPU. And uh, the CPU is a Motorola MC6809E. And in fact, all the, all the ICs in this particular system are Motorola. And it's because it's based on that reference design. So this particular CPU can actually be upgraded fairly easily to a Hitachi 63C09E, which is a pin compatible replacement, if you will, uh, or alternative to the 6809E, and it does provide about a 10% performance boost. Just below that is what's known as the SAM, or the MC6883. Now, the SAM is uh, SAM stands for Synchronous Address Multiplexer, and it's responsible for several things in the system. Most notably, probably, is it's responsible for a lot of the system timing. So it takes the master clock and divides that up as appropriate for various systems. And uh, so that's really important for timing. And it also multiplexes the video address lines and the CPU address lines. So it's responsible in part for generating um, some of the video output. It works in concert with other chips to do that. So very important. I think if uh, either the CPU or the SAM were to go, uh, you would see some, some uh, very unexpected behavior out of the system. So two very important chips. And then down below that, we have the memory. Now I'm gonna come back to this later, but if you look closely, you'll see this is actually 64K of memory instead of 32. And I'll explain why that is in just a minute. So just above that are the two ROM chips that are in this particular system. You could have started out with just one, which would be the color basic ROM. And then you could add a second one, which was the extended basic ROM. And those two built on top of each other. In other words, you had to have the color basic before you could have extended, extended added some things to color basic. And then if you added a disk drive and use the disk drive cartridge, the disk drive cartridge, which plugs into the cartridge slot, you could actually have disk extended basic, I believe it was called. And so you had these three levels of uh, basics that were essentially all ROMs that built on top of each other and just added additional commands. Like in the case of disk basic, it added the commands to operate the disk drive. Down below that, we have two PIAs. So these are somewhat similar if you're familiar with uh, Commodore 64 architecture, you'll know that there's two uh, CIA chips there. These PIA chips are similar in that one chip basically handles the keyboard. The other chip handles other peripherals that might be attached to like the serial line and, and things like that that may be attached to the system. Now, the one thing it does not handle is the joysticks because the joysticks were analog. So right next to that is this other chip, U2, and that is a digital to analog converter and that handles the actual the, the uh, uh, translation between digital and analog because the joysticks are analog and that needs to be translated into digital so that the computer knows where the joystick is at any given point in time. Now uh, that DAC also handles the audio signals and audio outputs. What that means though is that this does not have a, a uh, synthesizer chip similar to the SID on the Commodore 64. All of the sound generation is handled basically by the CPU in concert with that digital to analog conversion chip. So that means that when you're playing a game, when you have to create a sound, the system kind of pauses. And there's some creative workarounds that to make things uh, look more smoothly, of course, but uh, it's just one thing to keep in mind. There's no synthesizer chip, but some of the sound that you can get out of the system is actually pretty impressive. Now up above that, we have the VDG and the MC1372 chips. Now the VDG actually works, like I said, in concert with the SAM chip to produce the video signals um, and the different video modes that you might use for graphics, and etc. The MC1372, interestingly enough, is actually kind of an RF modulator on a chip. Although you can see here, there's another RF modulator so that they didn't use this completely for the RF modulation. All they used this for was to mix the color signals together and then feed those into uh, this dedicated uh, 
kind of an older old school, I guess, if you want to call it RF modulator. If we look along the back row in terms of the ports and buttons along the back, you can see we have power over here on the far left. And then we have two joystick ports left and right for two player action. And then we have a serial port, a cassette port, a channel selector between three and four in this case. This is a North American version. And we have a, the RF modulator itself, a reset switch, and of course we have the cartridge slot on the far side. Now I wanted to give you a little bit more information on the RAM because it's kind of an interesting story, something unique to this system, I think. Um, I found this particular document called The Color Computer Secrets Revealed, and it was written right around the time this system was produced. So there's some really handy information. Uh, if you look this up on Google, you can find it. And it gives a lot more uh, information than the system reference manual does, for example. And it kind of clarifies some of the things that are going on, and it certainly clarifies the, the RAM situation. So here we get some information about why it appears that there is 64K of RAM installed when the system is only advertising at, advertised as having 32K of memory. And it does say in here that the color computer, the way it's configured, can only address 32K of memory at any given point in time. However, it also says, as there are no 32K RAM chips on the market, Radio Shack reached an agreement with Motorola to purchase their reject 64K RAM chips with a defect of some sort in one of the two banks of 32K at a considerable savings of cost from the good 64K chips. These so-called half good 64K chips form the basis of the Radio Shack's 32K upgrade with either the upper or lower 32K of memory permanently enabled by connecting the appropriate jumper. So basically the way that they this worked was they put 64K in there, but these chips that they purchased, they knew that they were bad or half of the chip was bad. And so they had a jumper in there that you could specify, do I use the, the upper or the lower portion of these chips? And that's why there's 64K in there. Um, some of the information I found online said that the most of these chips or, or a good deal of these chips that went out, uh, were actually usable, that you could actually, if you wanted to, maybe by swapping a few chips out, you could actually get 64K of RAM. Unfortunately, you can't address all of that um, memory, at least not in BASIC, uh, not the way this particular system is configured. But that's why it looks like there's 64K of RAM, because um, there is 64K of RAM there. It's just that you can only address 32K of it. Kind of an interesting tidbit, I think. One other thing about this board that I really appreciate is that all of these chips are socketed. So if something was going wrong on the board and you needed to replace something, it would be really easy to do. That's a really nice touch, especially for a, you know, budget 1980s computer. Really nice. Okay, I'm going to move this out of the way now and we'll start working on the keyboard. All right, so here's the keyboard. Um, and it's going to be interesting to break this open and see what's actually inside. To do that, I'm going to have to take all of these tiny screws out. So uh, get ready for an unscrewing montage. There's enough screws here. I need to get out my communion cup so I don't want to lose them. They're very small. Okay, so that's that. Time to lift this off and see what it looks like. That comes off easily. Oh, that's not bad. They're just simple metal con contacts there. If we take this piece off, we can see they are indeed rubber domes. So my guess is that uh, really it's all about cleaning the contacts here. I can see some of these look a little dirty, a little corroded. And maybe that's the issue. So I'm going to get out the IPA. We'll clean this up and I'm going to be really careful. Ooh, look how easily those come up. So I'm going to be really careful with these. Hopefully I don't have to clean these because those little contacts would be really hard to clean. Uh, but definitely some IPA. Um, if needed, we could go with a little bit of deoxid brushed on there, but hopefully just some IPA on this board will take care of it.
Let's take a look at the, uh, the other part of the board, though, first. I'll give you a closer look at these little switches here. They're kind of cool. All right, so now you can see them, and boy, this would be awful if you happen to tip out this. Uh, you can see they're kind of, I just moved the keyboard, you know, a few inches on my desk, and these things are already kind of coming out from their uh, um, little divots that hold them in place. So, yeah, you need to be <laughs> really careful with these things. If you knock these things over on the floor, oh, that would be awful. And again, just taking a look at the rubber domes underneath. Um, you know, they're just simple rubber domes, and they don't have the connective uh, or conductive pieces that you would normally see, like on a gamepad or later keyboards. These are actually really nice, springy, high-quality domes here and just so you can see how one of these comes out the dome just rests on there and then the key itself just kind of slides into that little slot there so they really are just chiclet keys with a dome and a little metal switch to make a connection all right so before i try installing this mod for the composite output i just wanted to show you where i came up with it and how i put it together so First of all, um, you know, there were, it seems to be that there were mods for the Coco One. It was a very highly moddable machine. There was Coco Clubs, people would upgrade the memory, put in different things. I mean, it was very active community. And um, there were a couple of magazines that were out for the color computer. One was Rainbow Magazine, which I'll try to find a picture and insert here so you can see what that looks like. Uh, Rainbow Magazine was the one that my friend subscribed to my friend's dad subscribed to so we used to watch, we used to look at that magazine and type in programs from rainbow magazine there was another magazine though called hot coco and that's the one i'm showing here and uh hot coco was you know had all sorts of interesting reviews and ads again these magazines are just a lot of fun to go through and see how much things cost what people were talking about at the time um I saw a review in here, for example, of Zaxxon, one of the, uh, I think one of the better ports of Zaxxon that are out there was actually for the color computer. Here it is. Yeah, here it is. So you can see kind of what that Zaxxon looks like. Uh, really cool. It required 32K of RAM, uh, cost $40, and you could get it on disc or cassette. Uh, really good port, actually, of Zaxxon. Okay, so if we look here uh, at this part, page 98 of this particular issue of Hot Cocoa, you can see that Marty G Goodman um, has, I know his name, I know he goes by Marty because down here he says that you can write him, uh, Marty Goodman in Berkeley. Um, he wrote this article and tells you how to make this conversion or this mod to get composite output on the Coco One. And he even includes a nice little diagram here, a schematic that you can use to build your own, which is great. And he talks in here a little bit about how to hook it up, which chip, which pins, et cetera, et cetera. So that's pretty cool that back in 1983, people were doing this. And then recently over on Hackaday, uh, Barry Nelson, I say recently, recently in comparison to 1983, this was, I believe somewhere around uh, 2015, uh, Barry Nelson, I believe, took what we just saw, uh, that schematic we just saw from Hot Cocoa, and modified it slightly, and um, says that this works a little bit better for him. And so this is the actual uh, composite mod that I'm, I built, and I'm going to be installing in the Cocoa One. I find it difficult to just start plopping components in protoboard or stripboard and connecting them together. Like I need some sort of a diagram or something. So what I did was I went to, I pull up KiCad, which is my go-to software for building PCBs, and basically just imported everything that was in that diagram on Hackaday into KiCad um, so that I could reference it easily. And then I also um, went ahead and built that up, not into a PCB, although you could, but what I did was I put it um, into this representation here, which represents the strip board going across horizontally across this board, which is why it looks a little funky. So what I've got going on here, the red wires represent the built-in 
um, uh, strips of wire that are on the back of the strip board. So everything in this row is would be connected. Um, and then these wires here, the green ones, uh, are um, wires that I need to install to connect, you know, various components together from from one strip to the other. And then these little red rectangles are where I need to cut the connection, uh, because in this case, for example, you know, these components I want to be connected to ground, which is coming in here, and I line those up so that those could be connected to ground. But this connection on the transistor doesn't need to be connected to ground. So I need to make sure I put a little cut in the strip on the back of the board so that this is not connected to ground anymore. Um, and so that's what those little uh, red boxes are. And so what basically what I did was I printed this off. That helped me cut the strip board to size and also help me lay out all the components exactly where they needed to go. So let me show you what that looks like. All right, so I'm back at the bench and this is the board that I set up. You can see it's there's not a lot of components on it actually. And uh, it's fairly large. Normally when you would do this type of board, you'd be able to squeeze this down to smaller components. And like I said, if you were doing uh, if you were going to have this PCB made, manufactured, I mean, you'd, you'd probably be able to get by with like, you know, half an inch by an inch because all of these could be essentially SMD components. It could be really, really small. Um, uh, but this is the type of, of board I'm using. It's called strip board and it's got these strips of metal that go along the back. Sometimes it's also called Vero board. And what I've done is I followed the diagram that I showed you earlier and I've also cut um, the traces, the strips where I need to cut. So all of that, it is larger than, you know, typically you might do, but for me having the organization of knowing that my schematic is right, knowing that the layout's gonna be right, being able to plot exactly where I need to put cross connect wires, et cetera, is, is really key. And uh, what I've done here is I've connected it to uh, five volts in ground. And I'm just pulling that off of this chip here because I know where that is. When I actually go to connect this to the board, I'll probably find some other ground and five plus five volt points to connect it to. Over here, I've connected it to the inputs, uh, which are pin one from the RF modulator for the video and pin three for the audio. So those are coming into the board and then they're going out after they pass through these components, they're going out into, uh, this is the, um, uh, RCA jack that I'll end up putting on the case if I want to keep this composite mod. Um, and then that is going out. I've hooked up a sec second camera so you can see <clears throat> I've got a cheap USB TV tuner uh, that also has composite on it that is connected to my monitor over here. So I'll be able to tell right away if this works, hopefully. It's not going to be the best quality because this is a really crappy like $20 uh, uh, tuner slash composite input for the PC. So the, I know the quality not here is, the quality here is not gonna be representative of the final product. So I just wanna do a functional test, see if I get any signal at all when I turn this on. So let's go ahead and turn it on. Okay, that's not good. I should be getting something on the screen. Is it reset? Nope. Um, let me just take a quick look at this board and make sure that I've got everything set right. Okay, so I verified everything on the board is correct according to the schematic. I have turned this potentiometer up, which I assume increases the uh, signal output level to the RCA jack. So I've, I've turned that up as far as I can go and I'm still not getting anything. Um, the only other thing I can think is maybe there's a problem with the connections. Uh, one thing that I'm not sure of actually is this, the connections here on the RF modulator, because it says to use pin one for video and pin three for um, audio. Let me zoom in and, and show you what that looks like. So hopefully you can see where I'm connecting. There are four pins coming in, going into the RF modulator on this side, but they're not numbered at all. So I'm assuming that this one is one, and then they go two, three, four. It's possible though that it's the other way that one starts back here and goes one, two, three, four. So uh, I'm not sure. I'm going to switch these around and assume that one is up here, change these around a bit and see if that gives me a different result. Okay. So let's try it now. Fingers crossed. Let's see if this works. Hey, look at that. 
Well, it's a crappy looking picture thanks to this cheap uh, tuner composite mod input, <laughs> but it is working. Yay. There's a, uh, a, this is great actually. So I can, I can see that the, the RF modulator is actually, or the uh, composite mod um, is actually working. So that's good. I, I'm not taking this quality. This is really poor quality, but now what I want to do is take it out to back to the ping pong table and take a look and see what the quality looks like on an actual CRT and an actual you know TV, and then compare to see if the composite output is better or worse than the RF output. One of the nice things about this particular composite mod is it leaves the RF modulator intact. You don't have to change out the RF modulator to get this uh, working. So I can still choose if I want to, to have RF output or composite output if I decide to keep this mod. If there's no upgrade in quality, by using this mod, then there's no reason to keep this. There's no reason to do anything else with the system. So let's take it out to the ping pong table and see if there's any quality improvement in composite over the RF signal. All right, so I've got this connected first to the LCD TV and I've got it connected with both um, the new composite output as well as the old RF output. So let's turn this on and see what it looks like. There we go. And I should be able to switch to, so that's the composite. To me, it looks about the same. Yeah, it actually looks a little bit better on the, the RF as opposed to the composite. Okay, let's try the other one just to see the difference. All right, so there's the um, RF output. Looks pretty good. Now you can see the difference in the RF output in the composite output. So the composite output just isn't as sharp. Yeah, it almost looks like it needs to be boosted a bit. All right, well, that answers that question. I don't think the composite mod is worth putting in. I can test the keyboard though. Keyboard is working. Got a couple duplicate presses there. But it looks like it's working. Not the best experience for a keyboard in the world, but it is working. All right, so just an update on where things stand. Um, you know, I really wasn't frustrated with the fact that I couldn't get my uh, the composite mod to work. It seems like it should be easier than this. And so I was doing some research online and one of the comments on another similar video that's going on right now for Septandi, I'll link to that above, said, was asking the question, well, shouldn't it be, you know, as simple as tapping into the composite input into the RF mod in order to get a composite signal out? Wouldn't that be an easy option? And in actuality, it does seem to work. So I've hooked this up to um, both the audio and the video to the uh, audio that's being fed into the RF mod and the composite that's being fed into RF mod. And it does output a picture, which is at least, to my eyes, at least as clear as the one I was getting from the more complicated mod that I was trying to install. But there's still some uh, some blurriness around the characters. It doesn't look as good as the RF output. And at this point, I'm wondering if I've got some caps that have dried out. Um, perhaps that is an issue now. I've basically troubleshooted everything else. So maybe there's some capacitors that are bad. So the next thing I'm gonna do is try recapping this board and see if that will make any difference in the quality of the composite out. After that, if the RF if the RF output is better, uh, if I can't at least raise the quality of the composite output, then I'm just going to forget it and go with the RF output because at the end of the day, I'm not going to be using this system that much anyway. I'm going to be using my Coco 3, which has RGB out. So this was all kind of an experiment just to see if I could do it. Um, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. At least I've learned a lot. Uh, going through the process. So for now, I'm going to recap this board. Well, that was probably the most frustrating experience I've had getting a motherboard out, and I think it's finally almost out. It's still not all the way out. And what they did on this, they must have soldered this board on last because they had this uh, cardboard that has like a capped on tape finish on it to prevent shorting to the shield. So it's basically all down to this RF shield. They wanted to have or needed to have the RF shield there for FCC compliance or what have you. And so they devised the system where they had the, the uh, this uh, 
uh, shielding, whatever it's made out of, tin or something, and then the cardboard to keep things from shorting out. But then they bolted everything together, Not in, in some cases, like over here uh, where the cartridge port is, the screws go all the way through to the shielding on the bottom. And then you probably can't see in here, but there's no cutout around the power supply. So the only way to get this thing off is to take out all of this stuff that's connecting it and screwing it together and then remove it. And you can bet this uh, foil and cardboard and all this stuff is going in the trash because I don't ever want to have to go through that again. Crazy. And we're finally free. I still have to cut this out around the power supply to get rid of it. Crazy. Hopefully I didn't mess up anything on the board. I had to pull some stuff off pretty hard to get this off of here. There we go. One shield with, with a cardboard and it's coated with something. I don't know if you can see. Uh, camera's probably not going to be able to pick this up very well because it's there's a lot of glare, but it's actually this cardboard is actually coated with a resin or something. And then on the other side, it's got foil. So I don't know. They really went overboard with that because they didn't have any shielding on the top except around that one area. It's very odd in the trash. And you can see down here at the bottom, we have some more uh, initials and date codes. So that's kind of cool. Now you'll notice if you look at other videos of later models, they did away with this power supply design like this and replaced it with one that's in a cage. So, you know, obviously there has to be this uh, protective cardboard on top because this is all mains right here at the top of this transformer, uh, or at least I assume it is. And so they had to have some cardboard on top so that if you were in here working and forgot to unplug, you know, you wouldn't kill yourself. Um, but later they replaced this with a kind of a grounded shield that went around the power supply and it was all one unit that you could take out and the motherboard went around it. So it wasn't an issue, but I guess I've got to get this out anyway, um, because I need to, uh, give this a good clean and definitely we're going to need a bath in here. All right. I've got the desoldering station on and I'm ready to desolder these caps. I have learned my lesson in the past, and now I do these caps one at a time instead of taking them all out and trying to remember where they all go. Uh, I do them one at a time. That way I make sure I get the values and the polarity right uh, every time I, I do these caps. I brought out my big box of capacitors, electrolytic capacitors that I use when I'm doing this. I should have almost everything I need there. Kitty. Well, I've uh, desoldered uh, or uh, recapped the board as much as I can. This one, uh, this big one here, and this big one here I can't do, and there's a bipolar right here that I don't have that value for. But here's all the all the stuff that came out of there. Like I said, these caps, they don't look bad necessarily. Uh, it's easy to tell if they're leaking or swollen, but if they're just dried out, that's actually kind of hard to tell. Most likely they're good, but you know these are only rated to last maybe 25 years, 20 years, 25 years, and it's been 40 years. So it's a good idea to get rid of these, I guess, anyway. Um, but I will order the replacements for this one and this one and this one and change those out when they come in the mail. So I just got done with all that work and I took it out, uh, tried it on the uh, LCD and the CRT, and the capacitors essentially made no difference whatsoever, which was what I was worried about. Um, so at the end of the day, I am going to take this out, which is kind of sad because I think this project became more about, can I do it more than, uh, do I need to do it? But the signal that's coming out of the RF modulator is just crisper and cleaner than, um, the signal that I can get out of all the different composite, uh, mods and combinations that I've tried. So in this case, I think I'm just going to take these out, leave it like this. When I want to have that nostalgic feel for the Coco One, I'll just plug it into a CRT. So I think the only thing that's left for this after I take these wires out is to go ahead and give this thing a bath and uh, clean it up really well and make it shine.
Well, this is normally the part in the video where I would probably show some uh, beauty shots of the project I'm working on. And I've got to admit, the keyboard actually came out really well. Cleaning the keyboard helped a lot with uh, the stickiness in the keys. There was a little stickiness. And also, I think putting that deoxid, just brushing a little deoxid on the bottom of those connections, uh, got rid of the extra key pushes that I was, I was seeing uh, when I was testing it out. Unfortunately, while I was cleaning it, I put a little bit of IPA uh, on the case to clean off some sticker uh, residue, and it ended up taking just a little bit of the paint off the case, and I've never actually seen that before. I've used IPA on other painted plastics, painted metals, different things, and I've never seen it actually take some of the finish off, but there was some sort of reaction with the IPA and maybe some of the chemicals used in the paint. So while the keyboard looks great, and I can show you a picture of that, and it works great, the top of the case now has some marks where, the, uh, um, where that IPA reacted with the paint. So there's a couple things I still need to do with, the, with this uh, project. I need to get those caps in. I've ordered those. I need to add the little foot on the bottom of the case, and uh, I may be repainting this case. So there may be a part two coming up at some point. It won't be right after this. But at some point, I may take this back out and finish it up later in a separate video. Also, I spent a lot of time working on that composite mod. The composite mod, I tried four different composite mods, essentially, uh, to try to get some better quality output. And at the end of the day, it just didn't work out. The quality of the RF was just vastly superior, especially on a CRT, to the composite out. That's not always the case, but it was in this case. So... I thought about taking some of that material out, but I don't think that's good. I think it's important for us to show the times when things don't work out the way we expect, as well as the times when they do, because that's the way we learn from what we do. So I hope you appreciated seeing that. I know for myself, I learned a lot by going through that process. It was two or three days worth of trying different types of composite mods, building them, installing them, testing them out. I didn't put all of that footage into the video, but I spent a lot of time doing it, and I learned a lot about, not only about the way that the, the TRS-80 Color Computer 1 works, but the way the video output is constructed. And so for me, learning a little bit more about my first computer that I ever used was actually really, really fun, even though it ended up being a lot of work, and at the end of the day, I didn't end up using the composite mod. So thank you for watching. Like and subscribe. Uh, I've noticed that there's been a lot more subscribers. Thank you to all of those who have subscribed. It really does help me out. It gives me feedback knowing that you want to see more of this material. Please leave comments below. Uh, if you'd like to get this t-shirt uh, that I made up, I went ahead and put that available for anyone to order uh, on the website, retrohackshack.com. Go to the shop and you'll see this shirt along with some other ones that I've made in the past. I've never made those available before. I didn't know if anyone would be interested in them, but I went ahead and put them on the website. And then you can do a little mod like I did by putting this LED under the OK uh, symbol uh, for your color computer so that you can have that blinky light. If you want to see me do a quick video about how to build one of those, I'd be happy to do that as well. Just let me know in the comments below. So until next time, thanks for watching.